As we stay with the theme tonight, Amos 8 and 1, the Bible says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. I want to leave you with another scripture, Philippians 3 and 4. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in God Christ Jesus. If I could leave you with a theme tonight, it would be get your press back. Nudge that person beside you and tell them, neighbor, get your press back. This text tonight opens up with the word woe. And woe means watch out everybody. Whenever you see the word woe inside of the text, God is trying to tell you to stop. So God's word to the sinner tonight is to stop. God's word tonight to the fornicator is to stop. God's word tonight to the pervert is to stop. And God's word tonight to the liar, the cheater, and the thief is to woe. Watch out everybody. The book of Amos, Amos 2 and 6, 6 to 12, gives a transparent view into the spiritual apathy and moral decay of Israel's commitment to God. They perverted justice with dishonest scales. They trampled the poor into the dirt. Father and son slept with the same women. They, were stole, they stole clothing to wear, to wear at religious festivals. And they called the Nazarites to sin by making them drink wine and they desire luxury over the glory of God even in God's presence Israel lived as if they were invisible untouchable and unconquerable instead of rep repenting they rebelled Ecclesiastes 8 and 11 gives us the cause for the woe and the ease at Zion it says because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sum the men is fully set in them to do evil in the new living church translation it says this when a crime is not punished quickly people feel it safe to do wrong oftentimes we stay in sin simply because the sentence has not come oftentimes we stay in strongholds simply because the sentence has not come the believer the believer's commentary says this endless delays in the trial and punishment of criminals only serve to encourage lawlessness and create contempt for the judicial system. While it is important to guarantee that every defendant has a fair trial, it is possible to overprotect the criminal at the expense of his victim. Well, in the story tonight, God was the victim and Israel was the criminal. God was the one that was wronged and Israel was the criminal. God was the one that was cheated on and Israel was the criminal. Second Peter 3 and 19 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he's patient. Oh God, he says, no, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't does not want any to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Oftentimes we think that God is slow to bring judgment, so we stay where we are, not considering that God is being patient. He's stepping back and allowing you to get your soul in the right place, but oftentimes we stay stuck in the mire. We stay stuck in the mud, and we stay stuck in bondage, but God wants to bring us out. Somebody shout today, God wants to bring us out. Yeah. So the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 and 14 gives us the remedy for being at ease in Zion. He says, I press toward the mark for the high calling in God Christ Jesus. Press means this. It means to pursue relentlessly, enduring Satan's strongholds. Would you say that with me tonight? Say pursue relentlessly, enduring 
Satan's stronghold. Paul realized that in order for him to stay strong, he had to continue to press into the kingdom, press into God's presence, press into his glory, press into perfect fellowship with God. And I heard the Bible say in Isaiah 35 and 8, and how it shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others, the welfare and men, the fools shall not enter therein. We got to get our press back tonight. And as we press, as we pursue relentlessly, God is going to turn it around for us. And God is going to bring us back. If you believe that tonight, shout yes. One of my closing minutes, I can't leave Israel in Zion. The truth of the matter is that after 70 years that Israel was bound in Babylon, God spoke to the prophet Daniel and said that after 70 years be fulfilled, that he was going to bring them out. And I heard David say, when the Lord turned back the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. My God, tonight when you fall inside of sin, God knows how to bring you out in the nick of time. When you fall in a backslidden state. God knows how to bring you out. You got to get your press and press back and fight the enemy and stay in the test of time and fight. I'm going to fight until my chains come. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I got to fight anyhow because weeping may endure for a night, but shall come at the morning and say yes. I can't hear you tonight. Shout yes. Yes to God. I got to press. I've got to fight. Lord, teach my hands to fight. of a complacent nation. The book of Amos opens up with the prophet carrying a burden from the Lord during the reign of Jeroboam II and Uzziah of the northern and southern kingdoms. Now the Lord had given Amos to prophesy against the surrounding nations for their war crimes against Israel, Jehovah's chosen people. Now hence, Amos prophesies judgment to Damascus, Gaza, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, and Moab with the familiar phrase for three transgressions and for four, which introduces the message of judgment for all nations, including Judah and Israel. Now, I'm sure Israel was pleased that their neighbors were getting their just due, but did they know that a woe, a swift judgment was on the way for them as well? Well, why was Israel going to be judged? Well, it was due to a lack of justice and a lack of uprightness. Israel had violated and despised the law of the Lord and had not kept his commandments. Upright men whose responsibility it was to uphold justice were being pushed aside by a greedy elite. As a result, they were becoming demoralized and silent, and the emotional capacity for justice was being destroyed. The fabric of Israel's life as a people was disintegrating like a crumbling wall. These are the symptoms of a nation that has become at ease or complacent. Well, how did they get there? The reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam was a time of unprecedented prosperity. Wealth abounded and the people gave themselves over to a life of luxury and self-indulgence. Business was good and wine was plentiful. Ease and extravagance contrasted with the misery and suffering of the slave population who could not afford the bare necessities of life. The wealthy did not care. On the political front, the judges were dishonest and the government was corrupt. Sounds familiar. Usury, extortion, riots, and class hatreds were visible on every hand. Now, from a spiritual perspective, the people were outwardly religious. Songs, offerings, church attendance, elaborate ceremonies, and regular religious observances were all visible in abundance. The people were very pious in their claims to be the special creatures of Yahweh. 
Their religious leaders were professional preachers. Immorality was rife, and the religious were hated and opposed. There was much insincerity in what they called worship. Gross immorality was openly aided and abetted by the religious leaders. The rich nobles who took the lead in religious matters were selfishly indifferent to the cries and groans of a suffering multitude who suffered because of injustice, who suffered because of oppression and violence. Now, with conditions such as these, I believe that Israel's iniquity had become full and it was time for judgment. Now, the Lord was ready to send a strong word of warning to the northern kingdom. So he reached down into Tekoa and tapped the herdsman on the shoulder. He was a gatherer of sycamore fruit, a prophet by the name of Amos. And he said, Amos, go prophesy unto my people Israel. I'm sending you to a people who feel no need for preaching. Now, remember, they were at ease and they felt secure in their privileged status as chief of the nations. Doesn't this sound familiar? He said, tell my people, woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel has come. He says, Zion, this is what I have against you, you nobles of Israel, you chief people, you leaders, you notable men. Indictment number one, you put the evil day far away and cause the seat of violence to come near. This means you do whatever you want and whatever you feel, and you think retribution will not follow. After all, you think God is morally indifferent, and he's really not coming back. But I recall to my mind that the Bible calls these individuals scoffers in the New Testament, according to 2 Peter 3, 2 and 3, which says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Indictment number two, Zion, you lie on beds of ivory and stretch yourselves on couches. You who are unrestrained, that overindulge, that, sp that sprawl, you are materialistic and you luxuriously are out of control. You have become a slave to your lustful desires and you have put away being sober and vigilant. Indictment number three, Zion, you sing songs without any substance. You're just making noise because your heart is not in it. Your mouth is near to me, but your heart is far away from me. You ignore my sanctions and disregard my responsibilities. Indictment number four, Zion, you drink wine in bowls, the bowls that are used for my sacrificial purposes. Now, as a nation that has been favored by God, blessed by God, protected by God, used by God, delivered by God, and they had a covenant responsibility to turn to God. Instead, their belly became their God, and so has ours. When we begin to trust in our own strength, in our own devices, in our own privileged status, when we are lifted up in pride and arrogance and are blinded to the wretched and wicked conditions surrounding us, we have become complacent, and it is time for judgment. Now, we learn from Zion that a nation at ease will settle on their lees. We learn that a nation at ease will forget that it is a designated place for a blessing. We learn that a nation at ease will produce unfaithful priests. We learn that a nation at ease will neglect to fight the moral decline. We learn that a nation at ease will neglect to speak the truth. We learn that a nation at ease didn't learn from the past. We learn that a nation at ease has forgotten God's word. We learn that a nation at ease is no longer gathered in God's presence. Well, how do we fight this? Well, instead of being at ease, we wake up, we get up, we stand up, and we say something, and we trust in the God of the Bible.